All right, I think Jonathan's ready here. Uh, he, Jonathan Fields, a business manager or business development manager um, from the UK, and like I said, he's going to build everything live here for you guys. And I think there's a prize for anybody that can pronounce the university he went to. So I'll leave you to talk with him. Good. Thank you. Can you hear me? Everything good? I can hear myself, so that's good. Uh, thank, thanks, Austin. Uh, so. My name is Jonathan Field. Uh, I'm in the business development team at Cisco. Um, what that word, what business development means, I'm still not 100% sure, but it's a mixture of like doing pre-sales, technical stuff, coding, talking to customers, talking to product, a whole bunch of different fun and interesting stuff. Um, I, I work in the, in the Cisco Spark team, so some of you that have been around Cisco for a while will be familiar with what Spark is. If not, we'll touch on it briefly a bit later. Um, I'm based in London in the UK. I just flew out yesterday. Um, I've been doing iOS development in a number of different forms for about five or six years now. Um, I have worked professionally, I've done some freelancing, uh, but right now I'm almost more of a hobbyist. Um, I still do some professional stuff, but mainly building demos and talking to people about our platform. Um, I play flight sim in my, fl in my free time, so I have a joystick and that's pretty cool. And I have done some work once while doing a long flight, so I always find it's a good way to, uh, to relax. Um, if anybody can pronounce the name of this word at the bottom here, so if anybody can pronounce that, I will buy you a beer later. Uh, but the pronunciation is Aberystwyth. Uh, it's a place in Wales, but I don't know if anybody will have heard of that, but that's where I went to university um, a while back now. Uh, so what I really wanted to spend a bit of time talking about today is um, one of the products that we announced this morning called the Cisco Spark Video SDK. Um, so this is basically taking the media capabilities that we have through Cisco Spark and being able to take just the media stack out so that you can embed voice and video into your own mobile applications and, uh, and websites. So to do that, I think really there's three main things I wanted to cover. Um, just have a little short discussion around like why do we actually care about video communications? Why is it important in this day and age? Are people actually using it? Um, and then talk through how that will work using the Cisco Spark platform as a base um, and how you would actually go about implementing. And then, fingers crossed, we're going to do some real live code. So I've put together a, a sample application and we're going to go through the process if you were building something yourself how would you go about embedding Spark video capabilities into that app? So um, that's going to get a little bit more hands-on. Should be quite interesting. Um, I have tried it before, and it did work, but it's going to be very live. So hopefully that one's going to work, but we will see. Uh, so when I was putting this presentation together, I was just looking around, and you know, because I use video day in, day out at Cisco. We have video phones. We have video conferencing units. We have video everywhere. It's always on. And it was a little bit weird at the start, but actually you really get to like it after a while. Um, and I was reading about when WhatsApp added voice and video calling capabilities into their app. Um, the video piece actually only came quite recently, uh, but there was an article on Mashable, which you can see at the bottom there, and, and they were saying that just in the few short months that they've been doing video, they have 340 million minutes of video per day going through the WhatsApp video platform. That's like a crazy amount of, of usage, right? Um, I did try to work out what that was in like minutes or years, and uh, somebody can do the maths, but it's, it's an awful lot of video. And people really like the experience, right? I think most people would agree here that, that video is a much better experience than voice. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to describe why. I mean, you're probably going to say because you can see someone. If you can see someone, the communication experience is better. And actually, it's largely true. Uh, there's a couple of people that have done studies on this. Um, this is a study here. and. There's you know, three different categories in which he, he likes to talk about communication, particularly non-auditory communication, so being able to see someone. Um, and the percentages of like, what actually makes up effective communication is probably a little bit different to what a lot of us were expecting. Like, I might have thought it was the other way around, but you know, if you look at verbal linking, so the, the, the circle on the right, um, that is actually the words that you are saying. Arguably, this guy that, I mean, I'm sure he was a lot smarter than me, he reckons that 7% of communication is actually achieved through the words themselves. Obviously, if you're reading an email, it's very different. But through spoken communication, up to 7% is actually uh, what's being effective there. Um, the tone is very, very important. Um, you can get that through voice. Obviously, you don't have to do that through video. If I speak very, very loudly or very quickly or very slowly or quietly, you, know, you can infer different things about my mood. Um, but the most important piece in the communication spectrum is body language, being able to see the person, 
Um, I could be telling you something completely different to what it looks like I'm telling you if you, if you look at my face. So you know, it's, there are very substantial reasons why being able to see someone will give you a better communications experience. And this is really why we've seen the explosion of video, because it is a better experience. For anybody that uses like meetings apps or calling apps, just try putting your hand over the screen. Like, so if I have a WebEx call, put your hand over the screen where the person is talking and just listen. And immediately, it's much, much more complicated to understand what they're talking about. It's just much better when you can see people. Um, and this is, this is great. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm going to build an app. Uh, I'm building something that's going to have an emotive element. You know, maybe I'm dealing with customers. I'm doing some type of business to customer app. And I want to add the ability for people to call me. Um, anything that's emotive, so high value purchases, anything to do with health, all of these different use cases, there's a very compelling reason to use video as part of that stack. Because when it becomes emotive, getting that additional 55% of the communication spectrum that you get through physically seeing the person is really important. Okay? Um, just out of curiosity, how many people have heard of Spark? Most people in the room? OK, OK, that's a lot better than I thought. OK, that's cool. <laughs> um, so I, I work on the Spark team. Um, and I'm really just going to talk about now a little bit around like how Spark works for those of you that aren't familiar with it. But um, you can install Spark onto your iPhone, your iPad, Android devices, onto your laptop, uh, and also use it through a web browser. So this is a couple of different ways. Go to ciscospark.com, sign up for a free account, log in. You can send messages. You can send and receive calls, do multi-party calls, all of that. Um, so it's very simple for you to consume video calling through Spark today. You just download the app. It's going to work. Um, and what the video SDK is designed to do is allow you to take the media stack and those video calling capabilities, but use them without having to use the Spark client. Okay? So you're still going to be using your Spark account for authentication, but you're going to be able to do it through a device, a mobile app, or a website of your choosing. Okay? Um, another question. Uh, how many people in this audience would say that they are sort of familiar with what unified communications is from a Cisco standpoint? OK. Quite, OK, about a third. That's probably more than I expected, actually. Um, <laughs> so if you want to embed voice and video into your apps, you need to understand just a little bit about how you would do that. Um, we call this a call flow. So if I want to call, I'm signed in on this phone, and I want to call this phone. What do I need to do? Okay? So like I said before, right, everything with Spark really evolves around the account. So I have an account for this phone, and I have an account for this phone. So in this case, abc at xyz.com uh, and xyz at abc.com. Okay? Both are signed in on Spark. Maybe one's on the web and one's on the SDK. Okay? From a developer standpoint, you don't need to worry about anything. You just need to be able to tell the Spark cloud where you want to call. And that could be an email address of a Spark account. That could be a standards-based video system. It could be whatever you want, right? Um, so abc at xyz.com. Hey, Spark, I want to call xyz at abc.com. Okay? The Spark cloud is going to hear that. Spark knows how to talk to xyz at abc.com. And it's going to take care of all of the signaling, all of the negotiation, everything that you would traditionally need to worry about if you were building a system like this yourself. It's going to take care of for you. So all you need to know is the address of the third party or the remote endpoint that you want to call. Okay? So from a developer's standpoint, very, very easy. The Spark Cloud is then going to pass on a message to that third party or to that whoever the recipient is. And it's going to say, hey, xyz at abc.com, blah, 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 is calling you. Okay? That's all you need to know from a developer's standpoint. The Spark Cloud is going to take care of everything for you. It's going to notify the third party. It's going to tell you that it's ringing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Um, if you think about like, the topology that we have here, right, it's not a direct connection between the two devices. And there's actually a very good reason for that. Um, we would call this like a centralized um, calling topology. The primary reason for this is there's two things which are very, very important, particularly with mobile devices. So the CPU and CPU usage, how much of my iPhone's resources is it going to take for me to display those video streams? And also the amount of bandwidth that it's going to use. Um, if you talk about like peer-to-peer -peer voice and video in like a normal use case. You've got a direct channel between maybe there's three people that are having a call. If you have a peer-to-peer -peer call, the media needs to be exchanged between each one of those. So I'm having a call with you. I need to send you my voice and video, and you need to send me your voice and video. 
and it expands, it, it expands out exponentially, right? Um, your local device, in some cases, is even going to have to mix all of those streams together and display them locally. That uses CPU. Um, if you're going to be having a call with a lot of people, um, you might be retrieving eight or ten different streams from ten different people. It's going to be using a lot of bandwidth. So the benefit of using um, basically a centralized topology is that with one stream, because everything's being spoken to the Spark Cloud, it doesn't matter how many different participants there are. Everything comes back as one pre-rendered stream. Um, so if you look at like the, the bandwidth in the CPU, um, it's not a significant amount more for you to have a call with five people than it would be to have a call with one person, right? There's, there's pros and cons of using peer-to-peer -peer versus centralized, but this is part of the reason why we've gone this way, is that particularly for the larger uh, capacity calls, um, it's just a much more efficient, much more efficient um, process from a CPU and bandwidth perspective. Um, if you look at like how that would scale, right? The idea is that the clients don't need to talk to each other directly. Uh, so if you're having a call with four people or you're having a call with however many people, um, you've just got that one stream going back to you from the Spark Cloud. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I'm interested in using voice and video capabilities inside of my app. How do I actually go about using it? Um, one thing I was, when I came to write you know, my first app that used the video SDK, uh, it got me thinking, it's like, well, first impressions count. Uh, when you meet someone for the first time, that's a very important first couple of minutes that you have with that person. Uh, and actually, when you think about like software libraries and SDKs, and I want to choose this vendor versus this vendor, the experience that you have the first time you use the software is really, really important. And it goes the same for SDKs. Um, for those of you that have developed on iOS before, uh, there's a website called Coco Controls, which lists a load of third-party SDKs and libraries and helper files. Um, and I spent a lot of time on there just scrolling through, and it's like, well, this one looks like it meets my needs, uh, but I download it, and then I try and run it, and it's like, well, it's not compiling, or there's some dependency missing. Um, and really, what, what we've tried to do with Spark is, is make that as, as painless as possible, uh, but there are always ways to make things less painful. Um, if, we, if we look at like, the vast majority of SDKs and libraries that are out there today, they all have a lot of uh, what we would refer to as boilerplate code. Okay? Um, and what I mean by that is, if you take a video SDK, there's always going to be a certain amount of code that is applicable to everybody that's using that library. So where do I display the participant's video, uh, the remote participant's video, my local video, you know, what happens when a mute button is pressed. All of that is actually, in most cases, shareable between different projects. So if you can take you know, a reference implementation of basic drop-in video components and render that into what we call a wrapper library, which is one of the projects that I'm working on right now and I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute, you can make it very, very simple to embed video into your project. Okay? Um, and what I really mean by that is, from a developer's standpoint, again, you don't need to know anything about how Unified Communications works, how the video gets processed, any of that. All you need to be worried about is, I need to be able to authenticate. So I need to be able to tell Spark that uh, I am a specific user. I'm going to do that either via an API key or some type of OAuth flow. Right? So I need to be able to tell Spark, this is the user that's going to be making the call. Okay? I need to be able to specify a recipient. So in the call flow that I showed just a minute ago, where it was abc at xyz.com, as the authenticator, so he's the, like, the, the source or the origin, he's the person that's going to be making the call, I've authenticated as him, the recipient is the guy at the other end, right? So uh, xyz at abc.com, okay? that's the recipient. And then I need to be able to display the view somewhere, so if I have an iPhone app, I need to be able to choose whereabouts in my iPhone app I'm going to display that video. Um, if I'm using something with a navigation controller, you know, I may want to display it when somebody presses the start call button. Again, it's up to interpretation, but everything else apart from that can pretty much be inferred because you're probably, if you're going to be having full screen video, most people's implementations are going to be a full screen video for the remote person, a small video window at the top for the local self view that's going to be from your local device camera, and then you're going to have some buttons rendered in the middle, right? But all of that can be abstracted away. Um, and the example that we're going to show in a minute is exactly that. So. Authentication, choosing a recipient, and where do you display the video? Um, this is really what the, the wrapper that I've built is designed to do. Uh, this is the actual three lines of code that you would need to embed video into your own app. 
the first one, right? You're going to instantiate uh, an instance of the wrapper. So in this case, the wrapper is called the Spark Media SDK. Um, takes a couple of parameters, takes an API key. You know, it could take something from an OAuth flow, as you wish. All you're doing here is telling Spark, this is who I am, and this is the profile I want you to use when I make a call. Okay? It's one line. Second line, who's the recipient? Okay? What's the type of call I want to make? In this example, you can see it says Spark Media dot video call, and then recipient ABC XYZ dot com. Okay? Um, you could use audio call as well. There's obviously voice and video functionality. Spark Media dot video call, and then the recipient Spark Media dot audio call, and then the recipient if you want to do an audio call. And then the final one, um, there is a command here that's self dot present. What that means is my whatever view I'm in inside of my iPhone app, push a new screen up, which is going to be the video window. Okay? You don't need to worry too much about that. It's just standard iOS code. Um, but that is literally all that you would need. Um, there are some different functions that you would handle to see, like, did the call have an error? Uh, has the call ended? Those different types of things. But um, I'll show you that in a second. But it really doesn't need to be complicated to add video into your applications. Um, and hopefully that gives you a, a quick example of what we're going to show in a minute. Um, but let me just go through a couple more things first. Um, so when we were talking about the boilerplate code, the repeatable instances in everybody's projects that can be abstracted away into a wrapper. Um, there's a couple of things that most people will use. Again, it's like the 80-20 rule, right? Um, if you think about what you have when you have a FaceTime call today, when the FaceTime call rings through, you're going to see the remote party's video. So in this case, we're using a full screen image. right? The, how it looks on the left is what it would look like when you're building this in Xcode, which is the uh, default application or the IDE, Integrated Development Environment, uh, for building iPhone apps. Okay, so you're going to drag on a view which fills the whole screen, or whatever you want to do. Maybe you want to make it half the screen. Up to you, but most people will probably use a full view. Um, there's value to like showing business applications and rendering something on top, but again, you, know, you probably want to adjust the wrapper or you know, build something custom if you want to do that, but most people will look to, to do something like this. Um, if you look at how this works with like somebody that's got a, a landscape or a portrait device, um, it will do its best to display whatever it received. So you don't actually have to worry about like the layout. Just tell Xcode where you want to display the video, and it will figure out the best way to show it. Self-view. Um, again, in most cases, people will like to include a direct stream of what the remote party will see, maybe in the top right corner. Um, in the wrapper that we provide, uh, you can drag and move it around to wherever you want to, but it, it's up to you, right? Um, I've seen some people that, that don't want to do that, right? They might just want to have like one-way video, and they might want to have voice going the other way. You could do that, too. Um, but in most cases, people want to have a preview up in the corner of what other people are going to see. Um, so that's included in the wrapper as well. <clears throat> and then the final piece, really, that's applicable to most projects, again, there are some differences. But there's a mute button, a hangout button, and a rotate camera button. So I want to mute or unmute. I want to hang up the call, or I want to flip the camera around. So obviously I'm using the front-facing camera by default. Uh, again, you could specify different, but, but most people will like to use the front-facing camera first. You can make a very small change to the code, which is going to allow you to, to flip the camera around. Okay. <clears throat> there are a number of different events as well that we handle inside of this wrapper, inside of the SDK. Um, nothing too complex in, in this example, right? But there are things that you will want to be notified about as a developer so that you can take action. So if I'm building an application where I'm going to put up a loading screen, so I go and start the call, I want to put up a loading screen, and when I get an event back from the SDK that says the call has begun to ring, maybe I want to display something like ringing or just connecting or however, right? So I can give some feedback to the user. Um, and all of this is through like callbacks and delegation. And, and basically, it's just like callbacks. Uh, delegation is like a callback, but in... Uh, in iOS terminology. Uh, but it's very similar throughout uh, a number of the different platforms that we support. Um, things like call connected, when the call ends, muting and unmuting, uh, how do I rotate the camera? You know, If you rotate the camera, you might want to do something crazy like tell the third party that you've rotated it. Uh, you could do that all by intercepting the events. Uh, and obviously, like if you want to make 
the loudspeaker on the device active. Um, you've, you've got that on your mobile phone, right? When you're on a regular voice call and there's that speaker button, it's just replicating that functionality. Uh, but you can be notified when, when a third party's done that or when you've done it locally. Um, so all of that, but to be honest, as a developer, if you just want to display video, you don't need to worry about that. All of that gets wrapped up in the, in the wrapper that we've provided. Uh, so before we actually dive into building this for real, um, just a, a couple of examples here, just so you, if you do want to dive into the call examples a little bit, it's not actually that complicated. Um, so this is like the call did begin ringing piece of code. So you're going to get a call back when you've placed the call, and when it starts ringing on the remote endpoint, you're going to get a callback, and whatever code that you fill in is going to run. So I've displayed a loading screen. I've received the notification that the call has begun ringing. I just want to update the loading screen saying, call to abc at xyz.com is ringing. Okay. You may want to completely ignore it. It doesn't matter. Um, but the whole point of this is actually it doesn't look very complicated, and it's not, <laughs> is, the, is, the, is the thing. Um, when you mute and unmute the call, you're going to tie that to a function. In this specific example, you can see here where it says self.currentcall.toggle sending audio. If you think about like how the sending of audio works, right? You're either sending or you're not sending. So you're just going to toggle it. So if I'm muted, I'm going to toggle the, the value, and it's going to unmute me. Okay? Very, very simple. Um, in this example, you know how, like on FaceTime, where you hit the mute button and it turns, uh, turns red, from gray to red? All they're doing is just updating the image. Uh, it's probably like four or five lines of code, right? So when I do that, reverse the image to look the opposite of what it was before, right? Just checking to see whether it was sending audio and then updating it. Um, and the final one I wanted to talk about before we go and dive in and actually build something um, is like the, the hang up process. So, it, again, it's down to interpretation, uh, but you might want to, when someone presses the hang up button, you may want to make the screen go black so it looks like the call has actually ended. Um, there can be a very slight delay in how long it takes from you pressing the hang up button to something actually working. So, again, it's like a, an affordance thing, right? You're showing the user that something has actually happened. Um, in this case, we're just making a call to uh, hang up the call, and then based on whether that was successful or not, removing the view. And all of this is this is code I've pulled directly from the wrapper that we provided. So if you want to take the wrapper and customize it, it's a really good starting point. All right. So uh, let's have a go at building something. Let's, uh, let me just minimize the screen here. Continue. Okay, so I am going to mirror my screen up here. Let me get rid of this here. So um, this is a, a demo application that we've built for this session directly. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's a, an application that we're going to call Doctor Anywhere. Oh, I think I just hit something with my knee, and it's made the uh, <laughs> my bad. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is an example that we put together specifically for this session. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to have an app which is going to give you, as a, an end user or a consumer of the Doctor Anywhere service, the ability to make a call to a doctor or a medical professional directly from your iPhone. Right? Uh, so I'm going to sign in to some uh, hello at abc.com, sign in with some random password. And this is the app that we've prepared so far. So a very simple application that we've mocked up. Uh, a number of different medical professionals that are available. The ones that are available are in green. The ones that aren't available are in red. Um, and the idea here is that we want to add voice and video capabilities to this app. Currently, this app knows nothing about Spark. It knows nothing about voice and video. Um, and what we're going to do over the next 10 minutes is show you actually what the process is to integrate that. Um, the idea here is that I will click on something, and that when I press that Start button, it's going to kick off a video call. Today, it won't. Like Right now, it won't. Uh, if I hit Start, it's not going to do anything. Okay. So if I hit that there for a second, let me cancel that and move back. OK. All right. So let me know if this looks all right on the screen for you. Uh, did you see that from the back? It was good. A little bit bigger? OK. That's fine. There we go. All right. Is that better? Good. 
OK, uh, so you don't need to understand what most of the code that's going on here is. It's just the source code for the application that I showed you. Um, and the important bit that I want to show you is, do you remember this view here? This Start button? Yeah? There is a callback that is triggered when I press that Start button. That's what I've built into the app so far. Uh, so if we find that, you can see this line of code here right, is encapsulated by this callback. So that Start button, when that is pressed, I want to execute some code which is in here. So what we need to do is basically fill this function in with the Spark Video SDK so that when you press Start, it's going to kick off a video call to whoever the doctor is. Okay? Um, and the way that we're going to do that, uh, let me just bring up this, the command line here and make this a bit bigger. Uh, so, has anybody ever used Cocoa Pods before or heard of Cocoa Pods? Not very many. NPM? Okay, a couple. Um, Ruby Gems? Okay, those types of dependency managers. Um, so, think of this as like it's a basically a manager for third party libraries that you can very quickly add dependencies to your project and it's going to manage them for you. It's going to take care of versioning, all of these different things. So I can basically tell CocoaPods, the service, that I want to use the Spark SDK and it's going to figure out the files that I need and it's going to build those into the app for me. Um, and the way that this works is there is a, I'm going to open up the text file here. There's basically a file that sits in the root of the project and you specify the different third-party libraries that you want to use. So I used a library here called IL Login Kit to do the login screen. Uh, I had an alert view controller that I used. Um, and I've also included the Spark SDK, so the Spark Video SDK as a, as a component. Um, it's not been implemented in any way into this project. The reason I've just pre-compiled it here is I didn't know how long it was going to take to build the project on, on the stage. So uh, I've pre-run that, but actually the project itself knows nothing about how to use Spark. Okay. Um, so that's all I've done so far is I've added a line into my pod file that says Spark SDK. I then I'm going to go to GitHub and basically just download the wrapper file. So this is the wrapper that I've built myself, and you're free to use and update. And if you don't want to use it, you can just use our raw SDK, but it's up to you. Um, I'm going to download that. You can see it's uh, downloaded into a folder here. OK. I am going to open Xcode back up again, and I'm just going to drag and drop the files that are included with that wrapper into the directory. So I'm going to say new group. I'm just going to call that. Spark SDK wrapper. Okay. And then I'm going to drag and drop these files in. Okay. Okay, there we go. So we've just included those wrapper files. Um, again, all the wrapper is is I've provided a user interface and I've provided some code which is going to handle all of the boilerplate stuff for you. So it's just going to give you a, a drop-in component for voice and video. So uh, I now need to figure out a way to make this function start a video call. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go back to the top of my file. And I'm going to import the Spark SDK into the project. So I'm going to tell the project, hey, you need to use Spark. So import and then Spark SDK. Okay? So I've just included that. Um, there's one thing I need to include here. So uh, the callbacks. So there are some events that the wrapper provides, like, uh, hey, you couldn't start a call because you couldn't authenticate, or hey, the call is finished and you want to display something else. Um, in order to do that, I just need to include a a delegate function at the top. That's it. Just tell it that I want it to inherit from that uh, protocol. Then I want to scroll down, and I'm going to include those three lines that we showed earlier. So I'm going to go back to GitHub. Again, I'm going to show you exactly how I would do it if I was doing it for real. I would go back, and I would grab those three lines. So these are the three lines here. OK. I'm going to paste that in here so that this gets called when we press the Start Call button. I need to fill in a couple of pieces of information. Uh, so I showed you the, the API key earlier, right? Um, I have a text expander, x test API key. There you go. And it's going to magically fill in the API key for me. Uh, it was just a test account that I, that I created. And then we need to tell the SDK who we're going to call. 
Um, there is actually a function inside of this demo project I built that will do it dynamically because every doctor has their own address. But for this purpose, I'm just going to make a, a call to a static address. Uh, I'm going to call one of the guys at the back. I'm going to call the project manager for this project. Uh, is it 1F or 2, Olivier? 1F or 2? Just 1F? Two Fs and one T. Okay. There we go. So I'm going to put Olivier's Spark account in, right? So O profit at Cisco.com, O P R O F F I T. Okay. And then the self.present thing will figure out where to display the view for us. Uh, one additional thing is there's a little bit of handling code, um, and you can see that I actually pasted this in here. So if the call completes and if the call was to fail, we would get notified of that inside of our code. Now, um, when you start a new app on your iPhone and it wants to use the voice and video privileges, so you want to use the microphone, you want to use the camera, you usually need to provide some type of like, uh, feedback to the user as to why you're requesting those permissions. And the same is true here, right? For anybody that's going to be building anything with video or voice on iOS, you need to be able to tell the user why you're requesting those permissions. Um, and the way that we do that, there is a little file included in every project. And this is going to be a bit small, but just believe me that I'm doing it. Um, it just contains a, a couple of pieces of identification and, and, and different capabilities that you're requesting. So I'm going to add two lines into this file, and I'm going to tell the user why I want to use their video and why I want to use their voice. Okay? If you don't do this, the app will crash, and it will say in the bottom, you did not request the permissions correctly. Okay? Uh, so I'm just going to add two things really quick. Uh, one is uh, privacy, privacy camera usage description. So why do I want to use the camera? Camera, please, I'll put there. And privacy microphone usage description. Microphone, please. OK. So I've just told the, the, the project here, the iPhone project, that I want to use those two permissions. And then when I come to use voice and video, it should present that to me. All right, so I think that, let me just check everything here. I think that should be good to go now. We should be good to make a call, uh, assuming I've put everything in the right place. Uh, but let's try that. So let me fire up this uh, device here. Cancel that off. Just hit this to build. This might take a second to, uh, to compile. But while that's doing that, I'll show you uh, what this wrapper is. So like the. The reference implementation, it looks a bit like this, right? So when, when we come to demo this in a minute, it's got like a call timer. So how long have I been on the call for? It's got a mute button. It's got a hang up button. And it's got a button to rotate the camera. If you want to change those, you can do it directly from the GUI. Um, really nice, actually. OK, so we have our iPhone app that's loaded. So our Doctor Anywhere is back up again. Uh, let's give this a go. abcxyz.com. Password is whatever. So let's try this now. Uh, so let's say I want to talk to the cardiologist, Dr. Matthew Franklin. Now, if everything's working, and hopefully it will, uh, we should be connected via video. So let's try this. OK. Oh, there we go. You see where we said microphone, please, in the code? Same with video, camera, please. OK. And we, there we go. We've got have Olivier at the back of the room. You can wave Olivier. He's good. Yeah, OK. There he is. He's waving at the back. <laughs> there he is. So that's a, you can't see. OK, that's really weird. Uh, I can see on my, why is it not showing on the projector? I don't know why. <laughs> that completely killed the moment there, but <laughs> you, can, you can see it on my device, right? So that's the, the voice and video has been fired up. Um, in fact, I could, I don't know why that's not working. That's a real shame. Uh, but for some reason, it's, it's showing on my device. It's just not showing on the remote output. Um, but that, that's it, right? So that was effectively three lines of code. We included a couple of different things to make it work. Um, but that was it. If you want to go ahead and customize it, you can. Um, just for reference, right? So I, I work with Fortune 500 companies. Um, we did a proof of concept with one of the largest banks over here. We had voice and video integrated into their application for a proof of concept purpose in 44 minutes. Like It's, it's just completely different to what we've done in the past. So. Um, very, very powerful. I'm going to hang up on you now, Olivier. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to hang up on you there. OK. We, uh, we may try that again. I may just plug directly in via HDMI if that would help. But uh, you, saw the, you saw how it worked on my phone, right? Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the actual wrapper itself. 
Um, I think we won't go to the end of the hour. We should be, should be good to, to finish a bit early, but the wrapper that's, that's provided um, just wraps a bunch of that functionality together. Um, think of this as like a reference implementation. So everything that you need to use the video SDK, right? It's actually very simple. If you go to developer.cisco.spark.com, click on the SDKs link. Um, there's there's a, a bunch of guides that will explain how you can do it using the raw SDK. If you want to make it even easier, feel free to download the the link that I put up on GitHub. Um, and it's just think of this as like a bit of a tutorial code. So, you know, it's going to map the remote media view of where the remote participant's video is going to be displayed, the local media view with the camera, um, all of the hangout buttons, all of that's all wrapped for you. Uh, it's going to take care of the call starting process, what happens when you uh, want to start a video call versus a voice call because you might not want to display the full screen video, you just want to display like a black screen or all of that's handled for you. And if you want to tweak it, just grab it, take it. You know, if you want to make it work differently, look differently, um, you can do that. If you want to change the way that buttons look, I don't know, maybe you want to have like two hang up buttons go into the image and change that to be, I don't know, maybe you want to make like a rotate active button. There you, go. you could have that, right? So you can tweak it and make it look exactly how you wanted to. OK. Uh, 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 uh. OK. Um, so I mean, hopefully that gives you a, a very uh, quick introduction into like how easy embedding video into your apps can be. Um, anybody can do it. Like, actually, a lot of the shows that we do, we get somebody random from the audience to come up and copy the three lines in. It's not a particularly complex thing to do, right? A lot of it's taken care of for you. Um, if you want to have a go at this yourself, you can go to developer.cisco.spark.com. Uh, as of today, it's available now uh, for you to start using the voice and video inside of your own apps. Um, initially, we support Swift, so iPhone and iPad apps are going to be written in Swift for the SDK. There is some backwards compatibility and some tweaks that you can, you can do to make it work with Objective-C. That's no issue at all. It, that works just fine. Uh, on the website, so if you want to embed this into a uh, web app, um, we, we've uh, pr basically provided a, a library that's written in JavaScript, uh, and it uses the WebRTC standard. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with WebRTC, it basically enables pluginless video. You know, when you go to a website and you like think back in the day when you had like Flash, and you went to a website and it's like you need to install Flash to be able to watch some content. It's the same thing, right? A lot of the time, if you use some type of inbuilt video. Uh, voice and video calling that's embedded into a page, you need to download a plugin in order to be able to do that. With WebRTC, you don't. So you go to the website, and it's just going to work. Um, that basically means that today it works in Firefox and in some versions of Chrome. Um, the other browsers, as they add support for that, Internet Explorer Edge, for example, uh, not Internet Explorer Edge, just Microsoft Edge, uh, in the pre-release branch has also got support for WebRTC. So uh, really, that functionality gap is filling in quite quickly now. Um, the biggest one, really, that we hope will, will speed up is, uh, is Safari. There's no real WebRTC support in Safari at all. Um, when there is, like, it would enable so many awesome use cases. If you think about you know, you're having a, some type of consultation about a mortgage with your bank, they could text you a unique link. And if you had WebRTC support inside of mobile Safari, you hit that, and you're directly into a video call without having to install anything. Right? That's a really cool experience. So we hope that that Apple will, uh, will add that functionality in the future. So yeah, if you're going to be building on iPhone or iPad, um, you can go ahead and use the Swift version. If you're going to be building for the web, you can use the, the JavaScript WebRTC version. Uh, Android support is going to be coming as well. Uh, it's just that we don't have that available yet. So those are the two that we're taking for launch. Um, that's the exact page link. Uh, I'll share the slides afterwards. But if, and if you just go to like developer.cisco.spark.com anyway, then it will come up just fine, and you can, uh, you can use that. Um, so that's really all that I had to talk about today. I think it was uh, some probably interesting stuff for those of you that haven't seen how the voice and video piece fits together. Um, I hope it was interesting. We have a session, I think, in 15 minutes uh, through in the, in the workshop area, uh, where if you want to come down and actually build this out yourself, if you have a Mac, uh, then, then we can make that work. Uh, we may have to download a few things, but uh, please feel free to come along to that uh, if you're interested, and we'll go a little bit deeper into implementation. There's no reason why anybody wouldn't be able to do it. It's all very straightforward, right? We'll just replicate what I did here. So um, yeah, I mean, I hope that was interesting. Uh, we have a little bit of time left now. So if you want to ask a couple of questions, you're more than welcome to. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for, uh, for joining. And I hope that was interesting. <laughs>